Chart. Thank you ever so much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I suppose there's something really nice and elegant about following the great-great-grandson of Queen Victoria, who is himself 339th in line for the throne. And it wouldn't be a, an honourable member's speech unless we've got the council wars in. You can almost see King Ian leading the line and charging into that local authority, the one that he always tells us about on a regular basis. But Madam Deputy Speaker, this must be just about the th thinnest Queen's speech of recent years. It's certainly the thinnest the one that I've had in my 20 years. It was full of work in progress to be determined, one where we've still got to work out the details. And I know we don't want to overburden the Her Majesty under current conditions, but to have her sit there for eight minutes and recite some 937 words meant this was one of the shortest Queen's speeches since the Second World War. This seems to be the, the great Johnson Brexit government consolidating its place with the British people with a legislative programme that's about as palatable as diluted gruel, about as interesting as last week's dishwasher. It was a Queen's speech with standout features seemed to be voter suppression, actually trying, trying to depress voter turnout at election, taking revenge on the judges they didn't like during the Brexit process. And of course, it wouldn't be a Tory legislative programme without some sort of immigration measures, just making, that, just making life that little bit more miserable and intolerable for those in most desperate need who are coming to our shores for some support. And of course, there has to be the necessary muscle injected just to ensure that there will be no further protests against all of this and things will get done as easily as possible for this government. This is a programme designed to expand the power of this Conservative government and undermine all who may challenge it. A Queen's speech that prepares the way for more austerity, for a public sector pay freeze, cuts to universal credit and a savings and efficiency review of public services. A procurement bill that threatens our NHS in Scotland. No employment bill, no social care bill. But what is abundantly and absolutely clear is that there is practically nothing in this legislative programme for Scotland. And I think to me, more than anything, it just simply demonstrates that we are now living in different and diverse countries, going in different directions, requiring different priorities to secure the different futures that both our populations are calling out for. And that's fine as long as both our respective nations get what they want. So there's one bill that I want to see brought through in the next two years, and that has to be the Scottish Referendum Facilitation Bill the bill that allows the Scottish people to secure what they voted for only five short days ago. And let's just have a cursory look to remind ourselves of just exactly what happened in Scotland just last week. We had an endorsement to remind ourselves of just exactly what happened in Scotland just last week. We had an endorsement of Scottish democracy with the biggest turnout we've ever seen, phatic as it was overwhelming. And we heard a little bit from the Right Honourable Member, the Member for Dumfrieshire, just about some of the details about this. But there are a few things that he probably didn't feel necessary to tell us, Madam Deputy Speaker. So I feel it's incumbent to me to remind the House just exactly what happened. On that constituency side of the ballot, what happened was that the Scottish National Party secured 62 out of the 72 constituency seats available. We actually won three extra seats on the constituency ballot. We won two from the Conservatives and we won one from the Labour Party. And just for completeness, the Liberal Democrats also lost one seat on the list, list ballot. It was the highest ever number of constituencies ever won in a Scottish Parliament election. In fact, it was the highest number of constituencies ever won in any election in the United Kingdom. Such was the whole overwhelming nature of that success. Had this been a Westminster election, we would have won 552 seats out of the 650 with a parliamentary majority of 454. Just let that sink in, just so that you could understand the scale of that victory that we secured last week. And of course, the one that they like to tell us about was the list vote, because the Scottish Parliament votes in two sections, constituency list, to give that proportional representation feature and factor. Now, this is where constituency list to give that proportional representation feature and factor. Now, this is where all the honourable members opposite got all their seats. We only got three in the constituency side. This is in Scotland, and thankfully they were able to secure that on PR. But they've taken comfort from this. But as I reminded the right honourable gentleman, for the first time ever in a parliamentary contest, 
We, parties that supported an independent Scotland, secured a majority. A majority, a slender one at that, but it was a majority that they had. So that provides cold comfort for, for them. And that's before we even get into the business that there are Labour supporters who support independence. There are Liberal Democrats that support independence. There might even be Conservatives that support independence. But what now has to happen is that result has to be respected and the Scottish people must secure what they voted for. So how will this, go how will this government respond to this? Well, probably with their trademark chaos and confusion. Over the weekend and this week, we've had the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster practically based in the TV studios of Scotland, going around the studios being as clear as mince because of what we've understood. What he's told us, and let's see if we can figure out a couple of things he's told us. He told us that it is possible for Scotland to become an independent nation. Great. We didn't need him to tell us that. We know that we can become an independent nation if we choose. The other thing that he said, which was very curious, is that this UK government would not oppose a referendum bill designed and delivered in the Scottish Parliament. They wouldn't go take this to the courts. They would let that pass. Then he went and spoiled it by almost contradicting himself the next day. They are absolutely and utterly paralysed about what to do in response to this dramatic victory for the Scottish National Party. They don't know whether to clobber us and make things worse for the Scottish people, to deny us our rights, or whether to try and cuddle us. This is the tension that they're in just now. They have no idea how to respond to this. What I suggest to them, let's get together. We have to resolve this. We're now about 50-50 when it comes to this. We have to have this resolved. It can't go on year after year, election after election. The Scottish people are going to have to decide whether they want to remain in U Brexit Britain, determined and designed by a government they didn't vote for, or whether they want to become an independent nation run by people who they directly elect and will make the decisions about their future. That's the sort of thing they're going to do. And they call this the great levelling up um, Queen's speech. For Scotland, it was the hollowing out, the hollowing out of our democracy, of the powers of our parliament, and a direct attack on the institutions that we have running our country, with their internal market bill, their levelling up fund. It's the Scottish Government that should be in charge of determining the priorities for spending in our nation, not the Conservative Party, not the Dutch of Lancaster, not the Prime Minister. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, there's one thing that was decided and determined in this election, and that is that the Scottish people must have their say about the future of our country. The only people who could make that decision is the Scottish people themselves. We are going to have to sit down. Let's work together, determine a way to take this forward, and for goodness sake, let the people decide.